Pretorius Western discipline began as a Christian monastic technique, not a discipline of withness, of seasonal rhythm, of internal bodily rhythm and cyclicity. No, Christian monastic discipline was a rigid and deliberate program of anti-naturalists, ascetically and punitively pitting the spirit against the body, against the ancient flesh. The monks established a timetable that was ideologically hostile to moon, sun, seasons, and stars. It was based instead on the Christian mind's idea of how mortal flesh was to be straightened by forcing it to go against its own biological inclinations. This monastic timetable and ascetic practice soon spread to the institutions controlled by the church, the schools, and the poorhouses. The young, the poor, the powerless, they were the ones who needed straightening. If the body was punished enough, it would be thereby weaned from nature, and then the Christian spirit could bloom in glorious submissiveness. So successful were these monastic programs designed to turn human bodies into obedient machines. They spread during the 17th through the 19th centuries into the large commercial industrial manufactories of Europe. The spirit was never freed in this process, needless to say. It continues to share with the body in what Foucault calls a subjection that has never reached its limit. The Protestant spirit added greatly to this process by rationalizing worldly profit as a function of Christian spirit. The fundamentalist Protestant tautology that wealth is a sign of God's favor because God wants you to be rich is a perfect machine. While it grinds out the profits of morality for the many, it gathers in the morality of profits for the few. And thus, Christian capitalism, where God becomes a kind of shrewd world banker in the sky, exchanging souls for dollars and dollars for souls at a terrible rate of exchange. matrifocal cultures had no reason to deny the other, for all otherness was a part of the mother. They were the undivided ones, tapping into unhindered flows of ecstatic energy, which is both spiritual and biological, of earthly soil and cosmic thought together. Not needing to tell a lie at the root of things about the origin of life, not needing to maintain this lie by force day and night against the urges of all nature and its consciousness towards the truth, women's cultures would not have needed to maintain themselves by energy repressive systems, by coercive and punitive surveillance systems based on social caste or economic status or skin color or eye color or dress, nor would there be any need for hierarchic organization tyrannical terrors, or political frauds. What is ecstasy? It is our original state of being, it is the conscious expansion of the universe into a multitude of interconnected dimensions and forms. It is her dance of being from which all of us were born. Ecstasy is passion self-expressed through form. In the case of Earth, human beings and all other creatures and biological and geological activities are the forms, cosmic energy, is the passion. In and with the whole world is where we are supposed to feel it. In and with and as the whole world is where our human ecstasy is born. It is the celebration of the recognition that our spirit and flesh are one.
because the West was arrogant enough, or insane enough, to believe its anal eye was truly the eye of God, its will to total dominance truly God's will, its perpetual machinery of observation and control in fact the machinery of God, it made progress. Western leaders, the political, religious, and economic elite officially merged their prophets with God's prophets, and the Western peoples were conditioned consistently and grindingly from the 13th century beginnings of the Christian Inquisition to accept submission to this profitable machine as their moral lot. The patriarchal denial of the mother becomes the political denial of the people which becomes the total mechanization via capitalization of the human body. And as the body moves, so does God move. The biblical capitalist West has created God as a prison keeper, as a factory boss, rather than as a living cosmos. God as an assembly line rather than a dance. Both worker production and female reproduction are controlled and directed by the same forces, sexual, spiritual, ideological systems of piety and drudgery. Piety and drudgery reinforce each other by dogmatically, physically, and habitually repressing energy to a mere subsistence level, a subsistence level that is capable of only piety and drudgery, i.e. incapable of the revolutionary ecstasy or creativity necessary to escape the subsistence level system. And piety and drudgery is the normative state of being in which females and workers have been kept for at least 4,000 years. A return to the goddess is not a backward trip through space or time. The human race cannot really return to infancy. We're too far gone for that. We return to the goddess by remembering, redefining, respelling, by turning as in a dance away from one gesture and towards another. Patriarchal ontology is based on a three-dimensional reality. Modern physics is showing us that the universe has not four dimensions, but as many as eleven dimensions, perhaps more. The universe is undergoing ecstatic, exponential expansion into eleven or more dimensions. Surely, three-dimensional religions cannot keep us in touch with such a universe. If we do not want to die, then we must evolve. That, that means that we must dance expand exponentially with the dancing cosmos. We return to the cosmos only by becoming lovers of life rather than life's victims, voyeurs, and policemen. We must become beings who do not wish to control life but only to listen to its music and dance it. This is not easy to do. It might be impossible. But it is our only alternative to mass death, whether by war or by total global mechanization. The patriarchal God has only one commandment, punish life for being what it is. The goddess also has only one commandment, love life for it is what it is.